All right, guys, Adam Trigger, one more time here for Wager Talk. We continue to roll through college basketball previews as we approach, uh, rapidly approach, tip-off on November 4th. I have a special guest today. He's part of the three-man weave. His name is Jim Root, but he really needs no introduction. Great college basketball handicapper, great media uh, you know, person to follow for college basketball, so check his Twitter out on the screen. And, Jim, talk, introduce yourself and tell him about – the burner, which I think is going to be the home for college basketball research this year. Yeah, that's that's our goal. Try to turn it into that. The burner is a Discord, which is uh, for people unfamiliar community. You can join, and there's all kinds of different ways to use it. You can interact with people through some of the channels that are in there. You can just kind of read some of the news updates that come through there with Charlie Donovan's recruiting scoops, or you can get in there and, and get all our previews. We're writing all 364 teams this uh, into. Uh, the preseason here not all of them are up yet as we as we do this year but we will have them all up before the start of the season so every single team getting a real detailed breakdown statistical analysis look at the roster just kind of a an estimate on how they're going to be this year and that's that's something we've been known now for at three man weave for a decade so we're, we're happy to still be doing it and we found a pretty good home for it with with the burner we think it's helpful for people to read and you can also interact with us and, and tell us we're wrong whenever you feel like you need to <laughs> Yeah, it, it, the whole thing is awesome. The the, the Discord will is great. Like once you figure out Discord, it's great. A little confusing at first, but once you figure out where everything's located, it's 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 super easy to use. And your guys' previews have been kind of a staple of of my handicapping for years. Like this is a team specific preview today on Virginia Commonwealth. But if you're looking for the entire conference, uh, there there's no better preview out there in my opinion uh, than than three-man weave. So check that out. It's super cheap, and you'll probably make that back tenfold using that info this season. But Jim, I brought you in today to talk Virginia Commonwealth Rams basketball. I got a chance to go to the Siegel Center last year. Have you, have you ever been to the Siegel Center in your travels? No. No, I have not had my my life-changing experience there, as as Mr. Rothstein would say it. So I'm, I'm envious of what you've gotten to do there. Yeah, it, it kind of is. It was it was awesome. I mean, if you're into pep bands, Jim, the Peppas, they got to be the best pep band in the country. Although apparently there's a couple of good ones down in the same area. Apparently Virginia just breeds like pep bands. I guess George Mason has a good one, but phenomenal atmosphere. The thing I did when I left there last year, just up the home court edge even more. It's just a really cool venue that I got a chance to go to last season. Uh, but we'll go back to last season for a second. Ryan Odom, it was his first year. I would say, you know, I, I'd call it a success, even though they kind of fell short right at the end. Maybe maybe ran out of gas a little bit down the stretch. I'm sure they would love to have that uh, A-10 title game back against Duquesne. I'm sure if you ask Coach Odom, it's probably a game that he felt his team, you know, should have won uh, or could have won. Uh, but this is a betting pr preview. And, and I will say one thing, and this is something that I've, that I've tweaked and I want to get your take on it, but this is something that I've tweaked in recent years. Um, years ago, when you came into college basketball, if you really did your homework as a handicapper, you won in November, December. It was pretty much a given that you were going to be able to win in those first couple months. And it's gotten a lot harder to do that. And so one of the things I'm really looking for this year in teams that I'm looking to back in the early going is roster continuity. And I'll expound upon that. Um, you know, we always celebrate the transfer portal and this team got this guy, this team got this guy, so on and so forth. But it's tough, man. You got 19, 20, 20 one year olds in a new environment, new system. Uh, I feel like, you know, it's anecdotal. Like we know when it works, but there's a lot of times when it doesn't work. So I look at this VCU roster. I see, you know, four return, you know, four starters that were with the program last year, five upperclassmen starters. Um, you know, six guys that played starters minutes last year, two rotation players that were on the team last year that could be, you know, impactful this year. Freshmen that might make an impact, but they don't necessarily have to. It's not like they're going to be, you know, thrown into the starting lineup to start. But then I also see Max Shugla, who decided to come back. So, Jim, let's start there. Tell me about what, what transpired with him over the summer and how important it is for VCU to have him back this year. 
Yeah, just real quick to your point on continuity. This is a team that had none of it last year, you know, with with the changeover in coach and kind of changing styles. Like it was a lot of guys that were there to play a Mike Rhodes pressure system style, and then Odom comes in and plays a completely different way. So they were 340th in continuity and were pretty bad in November and December. Now, as you're pointing out, it, it looks a lot better set up for them to succeed right off the bat this season. And Shulga's a big reason why. I mean, you, you listen to Ryan, Ryan Odom talk about this team, the coach, and, and he just raves about Shulka's impact, not just, you know, in the stat sheet stuff. And he's he's great there. He fills it up. Uh, great scorer, great shooter, great passer. But just the kind of steadying impact he has as a, a bigger point guard. He doesn't get sped up, plays at his own speed. And for some of those reasons, he was maybe going to go to Villanova this offseason. He had committed there out of the transfer portal. That was the plan. And then due to some behind the scenes reasons, I've heard academics, not, not that he was bad, just that some classes didn't transfer over the way that they were expecting them to. He lands back at VCU, a place he's very comfortable with, a coach he's really uh, gotten familiar with from his time at Utah State all the way through to VCU. And that gives them maybe the preseason conference player of the year. Uh, Eric Reynolds is going to be up there. Robbie Avila, the, the newcomer at SLU, is going to be up there too. But Shulga is right up there in the top three or five best players in this conference with the potent backcourt that they have. You add him in there as kind of the figurehead of it, the leader, the guy that is the, the walking embodiment and representation of his coach. I, I think VCU's got a great, great start to the season with the continuity you mentioned and having their star guard back in the fold and, and not venturing north to Villanova. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of where... Uh, I'm looking to target VCU is in the early going, and we'll get to the schedule a little bit later. But let's let's stay on the backcourt um, because I think you know last year I, I pulled this right from your guys' preview. So another another great reason to grab those the burner and go and check out three man weave previews. I'll read it right off the preview. The Rams have the highest three point attempt pay, attempt rate in the Ken Palm era. Is that true? I had to read that like three times. So that's like 30 years, Jim, and they had the highest three-point attempt rate. Can you just expound upon that a little bit? I want to make sure I got that right. It's it's the highest for VCU specifically, not not the highest ever. For VCU, um, okay. But, yeah, but but yeah, I mean, for years and years, th- this team's identity has been havoc, defense, like all that kind of just pressure that was part of what made the Siegel Center such a difficult place to play. <laughs> And that's never really been Odom's identity. He's he's recruited a little more skill. He likes to invert the floor and have bigs that can step out and shoot. I think back to Brandon Horvath was a, a guy that was at UMBC with him back when he was you know, knocking off Virginia and went with him to Utah State. But he likes having that skill on the floor more than the athleticism, and he brought that. He brought that to VCU. They really wanted to spread the court, get a lot of spot-up opportunities, give their guys a chance to win one-on-one matchups, and and Shulga was great at it. Um, Zeb Jackson was great at it once they got Joe Bamisil eligible. He's fantastic at beating his man off the bounce. Those guys would get into gaps. The defense would collapse because they didn't want to give up layups to these 6'5 guards. And then you got shooters strewn all about the the perimeter. They've got a ton of them, and and that's when the three-point attempt rate just starts to vault way, way up there. Uh, some of the guys, you know, they they bring back a lot. We've talked through a couple of the names already, and, and I'm sure we'll go through more of them. But then you've got somebody like Alfonso Billups, Fats Billups, as he goes by. He's not fat. He's he's extremely skinny. It's a, an ironic nickname. But he is a lights-out <laughs> shooter that only got a little bit of run last year as a freshman. I, I think he's going to be a major, major weapon for them in this scheme. He really fits what, uh, what, what Odom wants to do. And with the other guards they have, he, he's probably going to get a lot of open jumpers. And that makes a lot of sense and, and adds up to some points for the Rams. All right, Jim. So another dynamic I've I've grown to like over the last, you know, since since the transfer portals really become the 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 front and center in, in college basketball is mid major veteran that transfers to good program, but they're not like they don't need to be like the guy. Um, so I'll just take like going last season. Uh, my buddy Chris is tuned into Baylor, follows the program closely. And I'll just use Ray J. Dennis as an example, like kind of came in and had to be the man, but like you you forget that guys like, you know, he just got on campus and he's got to earn the respect of like the team. And, and, you know, I I would say when you look at back at that Baylor season last year, like he, he played well, you know, but I don't know that he ever really like, you know, was like the true leader of that team. 
So you have a guy like Philip Russell come from Arlington, grad transfer, looks like he, he you know, he, he's shown the ability to score at the mid-major level, but doesn't nec- may not even start. It's probably not going to be looked upon to be like, you know, kind of run the team. So that's an exciting piece to me because for that reason, like, you know, they might be able to bring him off the bench, but his upside is, is pretty massive in my opinion. So I guess, you know, just speak to that point a little bit. And, you know, if if you're kind of looking at things the same way and what Russell's impact could be here. Yeah. He's, he's kind of the perfect little powder keg dynamo scorer off the bench that, that maybe if he's the guy at point guard, you can expose him defensively because he's a little smaller and especially up in the A-10, that could be an issue if he's the guy. But as that kind of change of pace option, you can mask him on some of the, the worst scores on the other team because the rest of their perimeter is huge for VCU. He's a great, great addition. He's made threes throughout his college career. He was originally an A-10 recruit all the way back in the day at, at St. Louis and then kind of found his footing at the mid-major level, as you mentioned, and, ha- and now has, is all the way back around into the A-10 at VCU. And I honestly think it kind of worked out for VCU this offseason where they had a commitment from Jamari Thomas, a point guard from Norfolk State, and he got stolen by South Carolina, basically poached, but was already in the portal, committed to VCU, and then South Carolina decided they needed an extra ball handler, and, and they swiped him from VCU. And VCU was able to get Philip Russell, which you can make a case that that actually ended up being an upgrade for VCU. It, it, both those players are really good. They're both, they've both been on winners. But I, I think just the dynamic it gives VCU, as you mentioned, it, this scorer off the bench, he was a great, great passer. He can run pick and rolls if they need to. He can do what I said earlier when they're spread out and beat his guy one-on-one, mm-hmm. draw in defenders, or he can be the spot-up guy if, if somebody else is the one creating in that particular possession. So you get a little more speed, you get some ball pressure out of him, and you get another shooter that can just impact the game off the bench and takes a little pressure off the starters where if somebody's having a cold night, you just throw Phil Russell in there and he'll give you 10 or 15 off the bench. Yeah. I mean, the, the guards look to be the strength here. Now, I guess if you were to start to look at, you know, I, I love the continuity and I think the guard play could be really good. Uh, I guess if you were to look at maybe some, some negatives or some concerns here, uh, it it could be scoring on the interior. Uh, That was an issue for VCU at at times last year. Now they do have some size. I'm seeing three, you know, guys like 6'10", 6'11", on the roster, uh, one of them being Jack Clark, who comes over from Clemson, but not, not a ton of scoring there. Uh, is is that something you think is going to be a hang-up for VCU this year, or can they overcome it with Shoga and, and those guys in the backcourt? Yeah, I think there could be some, some droughts offensively if the shooting goes cold, because they'll be very reliant on jump shots if they can't get all the way to the rim with those drives. And especially Shulga, you know, he's not some super dynamic athlete. He's great at using his body around the basket, but he's not going to finish over shot blocking a lot. So if they're not able to, you know, there's no post-up threat on this roster at all. Uh, I think they were bottom 10 in the country in post-ups last year. They did not seem like they wanted to address that issue, that they're okay with the way they played and the style they have. But there's nobody they can throw it to on the block and, and hope to score. That's not Christian Furman's game. And as much as I love Clark, and we can talk a little bit more about his his impact if you want, uh, and what he did for Clemson this year, uh, that's not really his game either. He's a more stretchy, impactful as a versatile defender, but not a guy that's going to you know eat inside and, and dominate the offensive glass or anything. So it, it is going to be a team that will need to make shots, and if they don't, you could get a comeback on them, or you could see them go through a drought where they're not able to keep up with a team that is getting better looks on the on the interior. But the athleticism is going to translate defensively on the inside. And so just not having scoring may not be a death knell. Just every once in a while, you could see it crop up and uh, see them be a little bit too reliant on the jumpers, which could lead to some shaky spells. So we'll talk about, I guess we'll stay on the, you know, the bigs and the defense and so on and so forth. Um, Where do you think VCU kind of lands defensively? Because, they ended up top 50 adjusted defense for Kempom last year, but I've, I've heard more than one person say that that might be fluky based on, on some of the shot quality numbers, um, you know, and, and shot quality. I talked to Justin frequently and stuff, and that's a, a, something I follow pretty closely as well. Do you think they've, they can, do you think they've taken a step forward with this roster and bringing Clark in, or I, I guess, is this a team that's going to, 
you know, maybe because there was a point in time last year where they played a 49 to 47 game with Dayton. And there was a stretch where they're, they looked unstoppable defensively. And then you got to the end of the year and their, their defense started to fall apart. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is like, where, where is this team going to land this year in that, in that metric? Yeah, early in the season, I, I thought this would be an offense tilting team because of Odom taking over and because of the guards that they had they had brought with them from Utah State. And that wasn't the case at all. Like the first month of the season, they couldn't score. They were in a bunch of rock fights. You mentioned the one they ended up having with Dayton. A lot of that. I do think they benefited from from some of that fortunate shooting luck. Shot quality's got them 137th in defense last year compared to 40th where they landed, uh, and 22nd in effective field goal percentage. That gap between 22nd and 137th, I think, tells you they had some fortunate misses from from people shooting the ball. And they do lose Toby Luol, who I think might be one of the best vertical athletes in the entire sport. Um, That man is like... Uh, he's just a powder keg in his calves. He can get up, he can block shots, he can dunk. They don't fully replace him. Like, that's not exactly Clark's game. But I really do like bringing in a guy of, I think he was listed at 6'8 at Clemson. He's now listed at 6'10 here at VCU. But he can guard probably five positions. He's long. He doesn't need the ball, which I think works really well with their uh, their pieces offensively, the guards they have that want to score. And he's coming over from a winning culture, a team that made the Elite Eight and was significantly better when he was on the floor last year. Both ends of the court, Clemson was better with Jack Clark, even if he wasn't the guy you know, scoring all the time or making the key pass. He knew how to impact winning. He knew how to kind of stay out of the way if he needed to. But on, de- on defense, he does make an impact. He disrupts things, gets in, in passing lanes. He can block some shots a little bit for a guy that's not a true center or rim protector. I like bringing him in as kind of a quasi replacement for a wall. And of course you still do have Furman, a big six ten dude who can, uh, can disrupt things at, at the rim and, and help on the defensive glass. They just might need a little bit of contribution from their freshmen off the bench. It, uh, otherwise they could have some real issues with foul trouble or have to play small a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. And that, that's a big question I'm looking at with them. Can these freshmen contribute even as somewhat highly touted as they are? Uh, it's a big thing to ask out of guys in, in the A-10 to contribute right away. Yeah, no, I totally agree there. And and we're kind of in the like betting prediction portion of the preview. And, you know, I look through this schedule a little bit. And so, you you know, early on, they're going to play a bunch of games at Siegel Center, um, which is, is certainly beneficial to them. I do think like, you know, they come out, I think it's like Bellarmine, Merrimack, Loyola Maryland, or I'm sorry, Loyola Maryland, Georgia Southern, Penn are all early in the season. There's some not so great teams in there. So maybe you get like, I could see them blasting some of these lesser teams, just being more ready to play, playing at home, assuming they're shooting the ball, they they, they could run it up. Uh, but what I kind of have circled for them, they, they go to the Charleston Classic, three games in three days. Um, you know, it, the, the, three games in four days. I'm sorry, Jim. Uh Tired legs in there, like that might might be able to find a spot to oppose them in that tournament. Um, you know, those are going to be tougher games. I didn't, I should have wrote down their opposition in that game. I forget exactly who they're playing there, but like, I don't know. I I, I think VCU is a team that I'm going to want to play on, like mostly over the course of the season. But the the it feels like they could be like an all or nothing team sometimes. So. Uh, are you approaching this team a certain way? Do you have any takes with like pace as far as total is concerned? Uh, Cause the people need to know what to bet. Yeah. I, I think they're, uh, you mentioned it right at the top, the, the continuity makes them somewhat of a bet on early in the season to mm-hmm. me. And to start the Charleston classic, they get Seton hall who is Seton like hall. Yep. the opposite of continuity. You know, they, they <laughs> brought in a whole bunch of new pieces because their NIL war chest was lacking and, had to lose a lot of transfers to the portal. So, you know, I know that's going to be two weeks into the season, two and a half weeks into the year. So perhaps Seton Hall has gotten it together and and gotten their feet under them a little bit. But it's still going to be probably a a pretty big edge for VCU just with their familiarity with each other, guards that have kind of figured out the spots that the other guys like to catch the ball. That's one of Shulga's big strengths is he knows where to get people to rock. Uh, So that could be definitely an opportunity for them. And as you mentioned, somebody like Bellerman, they lose a lot early on. Merrimack's got to learn their their zone kind of all over. Um, that's a team that might not be firing on all cylinders to start the year because of their complex scheme that they go with. Loyal and Maryland's got a brand new coach who could be playing a, a pretty different style. 
than the coach who got uh, fired over the offseason. So there is some turnover in, in the opponents, especially those by game opponents that we're looking at there, where a team with continuity like VCU with a really tough home court could get the ball rolling and, and really blow those teams out. Last year, I don't think VCU did that, and, and their right. advanced analytic numbers kind of trailed behind a little bit. You know, Couldn't get away from Seattle, couldn't really get away from Radford until late. I, I have a feeling Odom's going to want to get those, those wins on the board Try to do get get as big a margin as possible and just start staking their claim to a potential at large bid later in the year because I, I think they're going to be right around good enough to be in that conversation. Yeah, and that's a really good point when it comes to the A10. Like this league is is down from what it was like a, like years ago, where it's like you know, few I'll say five years ago, six years ago, maybe. I mean, you you knew top top three or four teams from the A10 were probably going to the NCAA tournament now. I don't really think it's it's like that anymore. So, you know, I do think these early games, that Boston College game in Annapolis, I'll be at that one. Um, you know, that's that's uh, they're going to play that on a neutral floor at Navy. Um, and then they have a, a road trip out to the West Coast where they play Colorado State um, on a neutral and then at the pit, New Mexico. Uh, but, you know, you get into the A-10 play, like, they, they have to rack up wins because if you have a team, you know, if you start losing to like the LaSalle's and the Fordham's of the world, you're, you're not going to get an at large. So yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, you know, to, to some of the lesser opponents might be in trouble against VCU early. And I, I'm kind of, you know, uh, of the thought that they're going to probably be a play on for team for me, um, you know, in, in the early going this year. Yeah, I, I think that's that's where I lean as well. Total wise, I wish I had a bigger, stronger lean here, but um, I, I I don't have a lot of take on pace. I think they're going to play pretty similar to last year, but I do think the like we mentioned, the defense could regress, the offense could kind of come out firing with the guards they have. So perhaps some efficiency overs early on, um, just based on maybe some of the defenses they're playing against. I'm not a I'm not a big believer in Boston College this year. I think you'll get a, a VCU emphatic W there in, in Annapolis. So. Maybe maybe that's one you're looking at. Just kind of keep an eye on what the number is. If they're if they're trending low number wise because of last year's defense, uh, I think that could be like you said, fool's gold. All right, we are at the end of our VCU preview. Uh, Jim and I will also be talking about Dayton, another team for the from this league. So keep an eye out for that, and go and check out the burner. It's fantastic. The three man weave previews are excellent as always. They're rolling them out. You know, as we speak, the month of October, all 300 and uh, however many teams we have, I think 364 now. We just keep adding more teams to D1, but they're all in there. Uh, they do a fantastic job, and their Discord is awesome. So check that out. Obviously, for me, all my stuff at Wager Talk. And go to our Wager Talk YouTube channel. Give us a like, subscribe, and you can find a great playlist with all of these previews in one place. Our Wager Talk video team did a fantastic job on that. And you can just watch them one after the other. We'll have 30 in total from now till November 4th. So keep an eye out for those. And uh, again, check out all, all of our previews at Adam Trigger WT on all platforms. And we'll see you guys soon.